Well, we are nearing April Fool's Day, and for tech journalists, this means wading through the stories to weed out what's true and what is an elaborate and maybe usually not so funny hoax. But lately, it seems we've been doing that a lot more often than once a year. Call it fake news, demonstrably inaccurate information, or propaganda. We've invited writer Patrick Tucker to talk about why it spreads so quickly. Patrick is a technology editor for Defense, Defense One and author of The Naked Future, What Happens in a World That Anticipates Your Every Move. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Hey, thank you for having me. So you write that recent research into the roots of persuasion help explain why people are inclined to believe and then forward fake news. What can you tell us about that? So uh, you think of news as something that you absorb with your logical brain. And the logical brain is the part of your brain that sits at the very front. It's the portion of your brain that mammals evolved most recently. It's the prefrontal cortex. It's not actually true. It turns out we think about sharing news and digesting information and interpreting it as true. That's largely informed by the social areas of the brain that are sort of on the side. Uh, so it, it's pretty interesting work. The pioneer in this field is a guy named uh, Matthew Lieberman. He's a PhD neuroscientist from UCLA. Uh, and he's been looking into this for a long time. But more and more research is, is, is validating uh, his original hypothesis, which says that uh, when we receive information, we first evaluate it using the social portions of our brain. Uh, and then after that, that informs the activity there, informs the prefrontal cortex. So it actually sort of changes our entire lens of truth. Now, uh, we've sort of always had this, of course, it predates uh, uh, news, it predates actually humanity. We, we evolved the prefrontal cortex uh, over the course of millions of years. But the online environment is, is what's key here because now entire groups of people can all of a sudden form a new sort of social sense of self and constantly find um, new, how you put this, uh, like pluses and minuses, like they can achieve uh, new points with a group almost immediately. It's a lot of social acceptance stimuli that you're sort of bombarded with, particularly when you're on Facebook, when you're on Twitter, when you're on any other social network, as a result of what you share and what you don't. And so that takes a process of social identification the pedal to the metal and accelerates it. So um, this is something that a, a fellow researcher of his named Ian McCullough, uh, he works at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and I met him. Uh, he's also a, an Army veteran, and he works a lot with the Department of Defense on some very sort of, I don't know, <laughs> almost Dr. Strange Levian uh, sort of work. It's uh, uh, What he did is he took this research and he applied it to how effective um, social messaging was in the Middle East around innocuous campaigns related to anti-smoking. And he found that, yeah, the news that you believe is very much uh, influenced by the social group you've elected to be a part of. And so what fake news does is it, um, and we're using this term rather objectively here. I'm not going to say like uh, that the people are fake news or they're not, but uh, what, they, what it shows across cultures, and that's really how you get to the um, neurological sort of human roots of this across cultures uh the news that most affects that lights up those social portions of your brain that's the stuff that you're most likely to share uh regardless of whether or not it's true so you can actually predict if you're hooking somebody up to an fmri the news they're most likely to share uh on not on the basis of whether or not it's true but on the basis of whether or not they think their friends are going to think it's true that's fascinating. This whole this whole read was like a, such a fresh take on this topic that we've been reading about and, and discussing on this show so much uh, in the past. So I, I love all of this kind of science behind it. You talk about the social part of our brain turning us into information DJs. How how exactly does that affect our ability to rationalize whether something is so obviously fake? Because, you know, somebody else can read it and be like, oh, yeah, please, come on. But yet, you know, it's it's still adopted and, and shared as real when, in fact, it's, it seems to many to be obviously not. Right, right. Well, it, in many ways, um, we develop this, like, sense of, of what is rationally true and what is, what is not uh, clearly true. Uh, because we kind of thought we were supposed to 
we're getting from our social network. So by information DJs, what this means is that we uh, use the social brain to create a filter that says this news is probably good for the crowd that we're going to be sending it to, for the people we're going to be sharing it with, because we understand now that speaking about news is is uh, very much a function of absorbing it. And that's not necessarily true. Back when we, what we, we think of news as invented, when people were passively reading newspapers or even passively absorbing like cable news broadcasts or things like that, sharing it wasn't a function of it. Now that um, sharing has become a key function of why we actually consume news, then uh, a lot of that, that social attention is queued up to really high levels because you're thinking about what news is going to appeal to the people that you share it with. So you become as much a broadcaster as anyone else. And that really sort of amplifies that. But the, the weirdest part was that um, depending on who you've aligned with sort of socially or, or how your social frame is working, when somebody confronts you with news that you in your social brain has determined is going to anger your social group, you become not just resistant to it, but almost like twice as resistant to it as you would be to news you're receiving objectively. And that's what the fake news phenomenon really is about, because it's not just news that we can easily disregard as fake. It's also this emerging uh, almost impulse to disregard news that we don't like as clearly poorly sourced, as clearly part of a conspiracy, as clearly not something that uh, it's that's super easy to denounce. And this is how you get a whole group of people and again, the politics here don't really don't really matter to this. This is a human phenomenon. A whole group of people who are suddenly confronted with information that they don't like and are immediately able to yell and find support for the call fake news, regardless of whether or not that's true, because they've sensed that that's going to alienate the group that they're a part of. So, so what you're saying is you know, we used to think of people as gullible. You'll believe anything. But, but what you're saying is really um, you will believe the things that you think the people in your social group that, that you want to be in will believe. Right, right. And it's almost like an impulse. It's almost like a reaction. Like you are much more likely to believe those things because you're much more likely to share them. You're much more likely to experience some benefit when you share them. And that helps the idea of acceptance. You're much more easy. You're going to be much more easily persuaded on the basis of something that you can share with no cost, no social cost. That you could actually achieve a benefit from sharing, uh, and so uh, that just changes your sort of your entire view of reality. And it, also, like yeah, to reiterate, it's really not political in nature. Uh, because I, I wrote this, and I, I was sort of interested in the, what the comment section was going to tell me about this. And what they told me is that this is definitely real. <laughs> and it's definitely post-political. It's definitely something that happens to uh, both people that feel like they're just talking to that one group all the time. And your entire risk-reward sort of framework is based on the stimuli that those folks give you when you post things, when you share things, and when you talk about news. Well, I, I think of it also as uh, what I hear you saying is there's virtual virtue signaling, right? Which is like part of what we do online is like we post things to say to show our virtues, to show you know how right. uh, you know, uh, interesting things about us or something like that. Whereas sharing in the past used to be like your mom cutting out an article from the newspaper and putting it in an envelope and sending it to you. Where it was uh -huh. like that that's not what we're talking about. Like she's not you know she's, that, that's not the same thing. So I mean. Is there, is there anyone, like, do you think that there's anyone uh, developing these systems, anyone like working at Facebook or Twitter that, that really has this in mind? Or are they using it? Do you believe that they're really using it for their own benefit? Well, I, so we know a couple of things. I, a moment ago, I talked about Dr. Matthew Lieberman at UCLA, who uh, first came up with this idea. Uh, he, you should watch this TED Talk that's linked in the article. It's fascinating because at the end he says, uh, as soon as I came up with this, I was contacted by the Russian government that wanted to pay me an almost ungodly amount of money to go over to Russia and figure out how to do this. So regardless of your, of your politics, understanding this is something that's actually really key to the way um, troll propaganda works. Uh, and it is an aspect of like just geopolitical events now. It's, uh, it's something that we've all been living with is uh, the use of content that's been shifted or changed a little bit by trolls to spread like a particular uh, point of view of news. So that's one group that's figured out, I guess, how to use this for their benefit, which is the Kremlin, which is Putin's Kremlin. Uh, it's also an aspect of U.S. military operations, actually. Uh, it's part of psychological operations. And 
We have a whole different set of laws and rules that govern the way we would conduct what's called psychological operations. But um, this is this is also an aspect of military U.S. military funded research is, is this art of persuasion. Uh, and it's certainly an aspect of uh, the business models of all of these social networks that we all subscribe to. But everyone's sort of approaching it from slightly different angles. Um, so in terms of actually curing fake news as, as, a, as, a, as a, something that we can fix, um, there's a couple of efforts right now by, by Facebook uh, through a, comp- uh, a nonprofit called First Draft. So they're reaching out to some folks that can basically correct things in your news feed that show up that are pretty clearly false. There's also a couple of uh, bills in Congress that actually address fake news, that address uh, sort of propaganda efforts by the Kremlin to influence U.S. public opinion, as well as German public opinion, as well as French. Uh, but fixing it is going to be ha- harder than all of that just because, like as, as we've said, this is an aspect of the brain that uh, never was almost weaponized in the way that it is now because we didn't have uh, a constant barrage of news or the constant opportunity to share it to uh, gain social value, uh, to gain uh, cred with a certain circle. Uh, and so we're, we're really in sort of entirely uncharted waters. So we can learn to spot it in ourselves and uh, and then maybe not spread it. But in terms of stopping it, that's going to be harder. <laughs> if yeah. we're living in a social yeah. media world, uh, maybe that's what we need is a post social media world. I, like, I don't yeah. know. Like, if, is there any solution? It doesn't sound like it. Well, you know, there's there's two books on this that I love. One, and I'll, I'll just say this very briefly. Uh, it's uh, One was by David Weidengerber. Uh, it's from Harvard and it's called Too Big to Know. And it really speaks to this idea of like, uh, a, a subjective reality overpowering objective reality. And you have a personal responsibility to like not let that happen too much. And the other one, which is pretty derivative of that, which uh, the audience might be more familiar with, is the filter bubble, uh, which talks about when you go on Facebook, you start selecting what you see, you start selecting the groups that you like, you, select, you start uh, pushing away the folks that you don't. Do that less. But it's a personal choice. It's not something that uh, on a societal level we have an easy fix for. Hmm. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. Patrick Tucker works for Defense One. He's the technology editor there, covers uh, defense. Defense One as a whole covers defense and national security news. Uh, it's uh, excellent if, you, uh, if you're if you interested in that and the, the technology section is great as well as the other sections. Uh, you can find it at defenseone.com. Thanks so much for coming on, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Hey, thank you for having me. Take Absolutely. care. Absolutely. Fascinating stuff.